thanks to The Nation Magazine and all the staff for bringing us together for this conversation on keeping the fight for racial justice alive. I wanna get right to the introductions of our rock star panel, starting first with Melissa Harris-Perry, who is a former Nation columnist. She's also the Presidential Endowed Chair in Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University, where she was the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Center on Gender, Race, and Politics in the South. She is the author of the award-winning Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, as well as Sister Citizen, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. Harris Perry received her BA degree in English from Wake Forest University and her PhD in political science from Duke University. She also studied theology at the Union Theological Seminary in New York. She has served on the faculties of the University of Chicago, Princeton University, and Tulane University. Next, we have Maurice Mitchell, who is a nationally recognized social movement strategist and a visionary leader in the movement for Black Lives, an all-around community organizer for racial, social, and economic justice. He was born and raised in New York to Caribbean working class parents and started organizing as a teenager, and he has never, ever stopped. As a high school student, he served as a, st as a student leader for the Long Island Student Coalition for Peace and Justice. He organized at Howard University, especially after a classmate was killed by police officers. And most recently, he started uh, an anchor organization to provide strategic support and guidance to the movement for Black Lives across the country. That organization is Blackbird. Since 2015, actually since 2014, Maurice has been one of the key organizers in the movement for Black Lives. And in 2018, he took the helm of the Working Families Party as national director, where he's applying his passion and experience to make the WFP the political home for a multiracial working class movement. Last but not least, Ellie Mistal is the nation's justice correspondent, covering the courts, the criminal justice system, and politics. And he's the force behind the magazine's monthly column, Objection! He's also the Alfred Nobler Fellow at the Type Media Center. Ellie is a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School. He's a former associate at Debo Voice in Plimpton and a lifelong New York Mets fan. We won't hold that against him. Prior to joining the nation, Ms. Stahl was the executive editor of Above the Law, and you can see him frequently on MSNBC and hear him on Sirius XM. So with that, um, thank you, illustrious panel, for joining this conversation. And I want to start by talking about the global and national pandemic in which we find ourselves, of course, brought on by COVID-19. We all know the statistics and the data. Black, Latinx, and Native Americans are much more likely to get sick and die by this virus. I want to ask the question about how we think about events. What do events initially beyond our control, whether it's heat waves or hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina or COVID-19, what do these events tell us about inequality and pre-existing racial injustices? And Melissa, I actually wanna come here to you first to talk to us about Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and um, talk to us about what you learned and how should we be thinking about events in this moment? Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say I'm not sure that I'm a former nation columnist. I think I'm still actually one. I just suck and never write. But, um, but the nation has been my home for a long time. And so it's always very lovely to have an opportunity to, to engage with other voices of the nation. Um, and, and I think on this point, it's so interesting that you bring this up, Dorian, because, you know, Sarah began by saying, I hope everyone is well and safe, um, you know, in the Southeast, where I live in North Carolina, you know, the storms um, came through. So we had a little bit of a hurricane that kind of um, pushed, you know, off the coast. And then we had actually a fairly deadly tornado that, um, that spun through last night. And I think that tends to be how we think about disaster. If I were to say to you, name the big disasters, right, or the, or the sort of shaping disasters of the 20th or 21st century, you know, you probably begin with the San Francisco earthquake, right? And if, if you've read a little Eric Kleinenberg, you might talk about the 1995 Chicago heat wave. Um, and of course, Hurricane Katrina stands um, is almost second to none in uh, until COVID, right, in terms of both its social, political, economic, and, um, you know, as we would think of just sort of disaster impact. But it's a really narrow way to think about disaster. Um, and it's one that in some ways, you know, Dorian as a political scientist, it's also how we think about what politics is, right? So we think of politics occurring every four years in these big presidential elections, um, but, but don't always think about all of the questions of power that are emerging at every point along the way. And so all I'd say is that the COVID-19 crisis, um, the fact that, that the pandemic of COVID-19 and the um, I don't know if it's our second or now third wave of the Black Lives Matter movement in its emergence and 
push towards real policy change. The idea that they're coming together is not surprising for those of us who were engaged in the decade post-Katrina in New Orleans, right? And so just very briefly on this, you know, Hurricane Katrina, of course, did not actually hit New Orleans. Um, the morning after Katrina, uh, if you can go back and watch, you know, national cable news say, "Woo, that, that was spared. And even as they were talking about that, the levees were failing, right? So the, 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 the force of it actually hit the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, but it is the levee failure, right? So if you'll remember that series by Spike Lee, when the levees failed, right? It's that breach and failure of those levees. And so that is, although Katrina is not a metaphor, <laughs> I like to say this regularly, it is not a metaphor, but it is a useful way of continuing to talk about these other disasters. So what's happened in the context of COVID is not only the disaster, but the levee failure, right? All of the public systems that are meant to protect us because we acknowledge that we live in um, fragile human bodies on an unpredictable earth. Um, and so there are all sorts of things that we are levees that we have built around us or that we should have built around us. And so in all the same ways that the levy failure had everything to do with the politics of the levy boards, that it had everything to do with class, that it had everything to do with um, elderly status, because as in COVID, it is the elderly most likely, likely to have died in the first week um, uh, following Hurricane Katrina. And of course, at the center, at the core, even as it had everything to do with race. And so consistently we think that disasters aren't racist, but of course they are. Um, disasters are racist and they are classist and they are sexist. And most of all, they are revealing about the quality of our public levies. So I wanna pick up on this theme of the levy failure, Ellie, and come to you because you just wrote a very hard hitting column for the nation about criminal negligence and accountability, <clears throat> excuse me, around mass death. Um, so talk to us about not only the broader levy failure, but who should be held accountable ultimately? We're, we're witnessing a crime against humanity. And, and, I, and I, don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say that. If you look at how the International Court of Criminal Justice defines crimes against humanity, what you'll find is that there needs to be three elements. One is um, kind of the act, right? It's either a persecution um, or according to the ICC, an other inhumane act um, meant to cause significant bodily or mental harm. That's the first element. The second element is that it has to be systemic, um, which is somewhat you know, self-evident. Um, and the third is that it has to be done with knowledge of the attack. Now, when you read what Vanity Fair reported about Jared Kushner and how the Trump administration essentially decided to not come up with a plan because they felt that it was hitting blue states um, more, uh, more, more directly. They felt that the deaths were hitting blue states more directly and that blue state governors would be held responsible for those deaths. When you understand how the virus has um, over uh, representatively attacked um, communities of color, when you understand that African Americans and, Lat uh, and, and Latino Americans are much more likely to live with an elderly individual as I do in my home um, because people of color are much less likely to put their old folks in homes, both for economic and cultural reasons. Um, when you understand all those things, and then you see Trump talking about opening the schools, demanding that the schools be open so that our children can come home and infect our grandparents. Um, what you have, I believe, are the elements of a crime against humanity. Um, will anybody ever call Donald Trump or Jared Kushner or, or Stephen Miller or any of these people off to the Hague uh, to, help, to be held accountable for their crimes. No, of course not, because the ICC doesn't do that. And the law doesn't do that. And so what we're, while we're witnessing this crime, this, 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 this sin of omission, this allowing of people to die in a, in a, in a targeted um, form, what we're left with is a law that is incapable of handling that, right? You know, as I wrote in, my, in the column that you referenced, you know, our legal structures are designed are not designed to stop the guy who fiddles while Rome burns. They're designed to punish the guy who started the fire. And because of our, because this administration, our, the American um, president at this point, 
um, because his administration is defined by incompetence as opposed to action. Um, that is how he is getting away with it. Um, he is, it's almost like he is too stupid to be held accountable for the things that he's doing. That's his, like, that's his best legal defense. And it flows from him throughout the rest of our system. I wrote about how you can imagine um, teachers um, who get sick um, thinking about suing the school districts who forced them back to school. Certainly you can think about the estates of teachers who die and there will be teachers who die um, suing their school districts um, for forcing them back to work. And then you realize that, that can't happen because any school district in this country, most employers in this country are just gonna point to the president and say, I was just following orders. And that's gonna hold up, that's gonna hold up in court. So, I mean, I think that as we, look, in the middle, a, a crisis is the worst time, I believe, to make you know, massive national policy. Like you got, like you solve, you had to solve the problem. Uh, um, law made under the under the duress of you know uh, of, of of a crisis is usually not good law. But the minute we have a second to have some distance and think about this, we really need to think about updating some of our legal structures so that this can't happen again. And by this, I mean so that negligence, so that incompetence cannot lead to the deaths of 150,000, and it's gonna end up, that death toll is gonna end up being far more than that. So incompetence cannot lead to the deaths of that many people with zero accountability. Um, well, I wanna get you in this conversation because Melissa gave us the broader context here. Ellie just gave us some of the, um, the legal and sort of accountability things to think about. I wanna get to movement, um, and particularly the movement for black lives. And Melissa's point about why it's not a coincidence that in the midst of this pandemic, we would see the emergence, the re-emergence uh, in a sense, right, of uprisings of black people uh, particularly. So can you talk to us about why now? Why now, um, especially Memorial Day, the death of George Floyd, in the midst of a pandemic, why we're seeing this latest uprising? Sure, um, thanks for the question. Well, I think there's a number of interlocking crises and factors that are kind of coalescing at the same time, right? And people have asked me, colleagues have asked me, is this in response to the torture murder of George Floyd? And I say, yes, and, you know, there, there also were several murders that took place in the, in the context of the past few months. And there also was COVID-19 policing that was taking place, right? So the, the, the public health orders were reinforced by the state through police and that policing was very racialized. So before George Floyd's murder, we were seeing on social media, all of these instances of largely black and brown young people in black communities being brutalized by, by police because we weren't wearing masks or we were too close, we weren't social distancing and juxtaposed with white people on lawns in Central Park in the same cities, right? So COVID-19, any, any crisis creates more opportunities for these fissures to be just in, in clearer relief. So the policing was more intense on our folks. And COVID-19 is a complete systems collapse of all of our systems, our global systems, our glo glo global economic system, our social systems, because we're, we're physically distant from one another, our healthcare system. And that hits working class and poor people harder. And, and naturally that hits black folks and other people of color harder. So we're experiencing now depression level unemployment, right? There are uh, food lines that are hours long. Um, there is the or, already the policing that we're experiencing on top of the unique COVID-19 policing, right? So this is like the four or five months that is kind of like a pressure cooker we're under. Then the four years of uh, the unique sort of uh, authoritarianism and racism of uh, Donald Trump. And this also is like the end of 40 years of neoliberalism, right? Starting in the late 70s, where there has been a consensus with both Democrats and Republicans to disinvest from the commons and invest in jails, policing, prisons, right? 
So all of those things are happening. And the thing that I say is like, we don't, we never know when or how or what form the crisis will, will sort of meet us. But what we're, we're sure of is under capitalism, there will be crises, right? And so we should not be surprised when crises arise and when our systems just don't have the ability to deal with them. One of the things that I think this crisis has exposed is both the limitations and the failures of our economic model, of neoliberal capitalism, of racial capitalism. So, you know, for example, this whole idea that healthcare is a commodity that could be bought and sold, that doesn't make sense now, and everybody knows it, because it actually doesn't matter who somebody in my community is, what their immigration status is, whether or not they have a job, I need them to have health care. If they don't have health care, that threatens my life, my family's life. And so, you know, the, the other logic, I don't think there's anybody that thinks that hedge fund managers somehow are more valuable than tomato pickers and people on the, um, you know, people on the, the food, food chain and, and people who are allowing us to, to, to be able to eat and, and to be able to provide sustenance to our families. This whole idea, this whole logic of essential workers is, to me, it's a, a mass education in Marxism <laughs> that we've all sort of experienced now. And so nobody's under any aspersion that sort of, um, you know, Wall Street raiders have some sort of unique value in our economy. People understand the value actually comes from working people. So it, the, to me, what we're experiencing is, uh, you know, it's like the 40 years of neoliberalism. It's also like the four centuries that we've, we've been here since, since 1619. It's all of those things. Um, and, and it's kind of all meeting in like, a, you know, we're at the eye of several storms. So we're at the eye of the, the, the storm of a reckoning around the four centuries of, um, you know, that started with uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade. We're at the eye of the storm of the four decades that started with the neoliberal era. And we're at we're in the eye of the storm of, storm of the four years that marks the Trump era. It's all those things. Um, and I think we can't talk about this without having all of that context. Mm -hmm. Melissa, I, I want to jump in. Go for it. All right. So. So I love and also want to take some challenge with some of these. So I want to I want to combine though both this idea and this concern with um, particularly some kind of legal capacity to hold responsible those who are responsible and Maurice's point about the path dependency that gets us here, right? So this is this is in part the point about disaster, right? Disaster isn't the moment that occurs, right? It is. It is actually all those underlying conditions, right, that allow the natural disaster, the hurricane, the flood, whatever, to have this disparate impact. So if, if we're going to start dragging folks off to the Hague, sure, let's, let's take Trump. But I'm wondering if we also take um, Bill Clinton, whose, um, you know, policies around both poverty and incarceration created so much more vulnerability so that when this storm hit, it hit exactly those populations who had been targeted by the Clinton administration's poverty and incarceration um, policies. I wonder if we're taking President Obama off too, right, based on the, the policies and choices of his administration. So I, um, I, I just lay that out there because I do worry about our idea that culpability for any moment this complex can lie exclusively with the figure that is Donald Trump. Because I do not want, I want us to vote. I want people to vote Donald Trump out of office, but I do not want people to believe that the voting of Donald Trump out of office will create a, you know, like justice on the horizon and the, you know, the, the rebuilding of an American dream or something, right? Because Maurice's exact point about this four, 40, 400 years, I think is crucial. But then I, I just also want to, to engage a little bit on, on Reese's idea about being at the eye of the storm, because I'm, I'm just old enough to feel like, what other young person? I mean, there might be a lot of eyes, so I don't really want to do like the old lady activist thing or just the straight up old lady thing. But I do want, to, I'm just enjoying it in the chat. Somebody's like, yes, please do. It's also funny. Um, but I do want to just point out, I, I, I'm not sure that I think of this as the eye of like one central storm, but rather um, a kind of, so just as this is a wave of the movement for black lives and because 
our sisters articulated that for us. We can identify it, right? 2012 to 2013 to 14, right to this moment. But also that to say Black Lives Matter pushes back to, right, the moment in Katrina when folks are standing on, the, my neighbors are standing on their roof, right, saying my life matters. And then it pushes back from there, and then it pushes back from there. So that um, there isn't some single eye, and there's not some single point, but rather that we are in these continuing struggles um, with these centrifugal forces. So I, I'm sure you meant that, but I also just want to acknowledge, right, even when it feels like this has got to be the moment, it's probably one of the moments. Mm -hmm. Can I pick up on something you just said, Melissa? And it's not a conversation unless Melissa agitates us all. So I appreciate the because she's an organizer at heart. Um, you mentioned several politicians and voting. And it's an election season, right? So I actually want to start to connect some dots here. And I'm going to come to you, Mo, first. And then, Ellie, you can respond to any and everything here. But Mo, um, there is an electoral strategy to the movement for black lives. Um, in fact, you actually work for a political party. So Absolutely. connect the dots between movement work, movement organizing, and how electoral and elect electoral work and elections are seen in this moment. Because I do think it's a unique moment. There, there are many decades where movement activists and organizers eschewed electoral politics altogether. And by the way, as we speak this morning, there was sort of a, to use a metaphor, there was a political earthquake last night in St. Louis and in Missouri, uh, Cory Bush defeated a 10-term incumbent. Medicaid expansion, which was on the ballot, was approved, right? Saving the, literally saving the lives of thousands, tens of thousands of low-income people in the state, especially people of color. So talk to us about how do you make, how, what, do we, what should we know about the interplay of electoral um, organizing and elections and movement work? Yeah, so there's, I think there's a natural tension and synergy there, right? And movements, the prerogatives of social movements um, are in, different than the prerogatives of electoral organizing, right? Which creates the tension. Social, social movements, when, that, when they're at their best, seek to surface contradictions and, and sort of visibilize the, the invisible in our society so that we could look at them, we could challenge them, we can transform them. And they, they're able to aggregate a lot of energy, outside energy, movement energy, many, many people, but not necessarily 50% plus one. And movements, when they're effective, are, are often um, which side are you are moments, right? So sometimes people say, oh, this movement is divisive. Yes, that's the point, <laughs> right? Um, movements seek to, to be very clear and bi offer a binary choice. Are you with us or are you against us? And that's sort of how movements are able to be, attract hundreds of thousands of millions of people in a short period of time. The prerogatives of electoral organizing is to get to 50% plus one by any means, right? And so they're, they're sort of different, they're structured very differently. Now, I want to talk about the synergy, and I want to just provide a little context. So, you know, in 2014, when the movement for Black Lives uh, sort of was emergent in response to uh, the murder of, of, uh, of Eric Garner and the, uh, the murder of, of Mike Brown, uh, there was this conversation in movement around what is our relationship to electoral, electoral organizing, the electoral space, civic engagement. And over the years, the movement developed its own framework to understand how to engage and, and uses this term electoral justice, where the movement seeks to utilize elections as an, almost as an, another form of direct action, right? And to assure that movement accountable activists and organizers have a pathway to elected office. And I want to explain why. The best example I could use is dur during uh, the movement for Black Lives in 2014, 2015, when these issues were raised, you know, um, one of the things that, that the movement can do is post questions and, and surface contradictions. But without the ability to answer the question and to resolve the con contradiction, we know that the most organized forces in our society will attempt to answer those questions. And so Taser International, the, uh, the corporation that uh, creates the most quote unquote non-lethal sort of uh, uh, weapons for, for law enforcement, they, they offered body cameras as the solution. And they have the capacity to be able to lobby for body cameras in state houses, in DC, um, city by city, and offer body cameras for free as a, as a service and then sold the, the data on the back end. 
And, you know, in a few weeks, you heard, you heard uh, Barack Obama mention body cameras as, a, as a, a smart solution, right? And so why do I say that? So we surfaced this contradiction, right? And the solution was body cameras, a corporate solution that actually didn't real, deal with the root cause. And I think from there, we recognized that we had to have dual power. We have to have the, the ability to call the question and then to use some sort of tools to answer the question. And for working people, because we don't have the capacity of organized, organized capital, we could use the state by actually being in office to answer those questions. And so over the years, we've developed this concept of electoral justice and people like Kayla Reed in St. Louis who's doing amazing work, Jessica Bird who's doing amazing work and many, many others really created a movement that aligns the prerogatives and the intensity and the clarity of, of our movement with the, with the uh, mechanics and ability to, to be able to run and win. And so yesterday's victories in St. Louis, you know, the victory of Jamal Bowman in the Bronx, uh, you know, uh, Mondaire Jones, um, the near victory of, of Charles Booker in Kentucky. Uh, in Kentucky. Um, and then on the down ballot, like down ballot races are really exciting. So, you know, Janice Lewis George in DC, Khalil Anderson and Jabari Brisport in New York. Um, and then DA races, uh, Jose Garza in Austin, Eli Slavitt in Ann Arbor yesterday, many, many races in Colorado. It really paints this picture that folks who are accountable to movements are now using, um, using elections and electoral power as a tool to advance movements. And I think that that is a, a outgrowth of sort of how the movement for Black Lives has developed. And, and you know, for me, I come from a working class Caribbean household. We use all the tools on the table. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're going to figure out how to use electoral power as well as movement power in order to get the job done. Ellie, I want to get you back in the conversation and pick up on some of the things Maurice was just talking about, especially the down ballot races. We tend to focus only, only, only on the White House. But these DA races, which has been, a, frankly, a movement the last decade around targeting prosecutors as a central link in the broader mass incarceration system, um, but also, I just want to point out, because um, you write a lot about ICE and Department of Homeland Security, in addition to local police, there were sort of like two parallel movements, right? The immigrant justice movement was, for years, talking about abolish ICE uh, because of the harm that ICE, in terms of enforcement, uh, interior enforcement, and detention centers was doing, particularly on, on brown <laughs> immigrant folks. And then there's this, right, movement for Black Lives led focus on local police violence. How do you make sense um, of enforcement of the law of pushing back and trying to transform these systems and by the way i'm gonna throw one more thing at you why doesn't the left focus on courts like the right does Woo. okay <laughs> put that last one in. <laughs> <laughs> Just, um all right how can i we focus entirely too much on the president one of the reason why I can happily and enthusiastically say I'm going to vote for Joe Biden, even though he was like my eighth or ninth maybe choice in the primary process, is that the president actually isn't the most important person, right? Like there, there, there are, or at least the president is, is, is involved in so many other decisions that are critically important where a, any Democrat, any warm body Democrats decisions are going to be so much better than the comparable Republican decisions. Yeah, I see. I see you there, but like, it, but if we just just think about the Supreme Court, right? Like, just think about the delta between any Joe Biden nominee for the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is eighty-seven years old. Stephen Breyer is eighty-one years old. Just think about the delta between any one of those picks versus the Naomi Rao, Amy Coney Barrett, crazy people that a Republican will put on that seat. I would, I would be happy to talk about how the Democrats and one Democrat in particular, President Obama's failure to understand how to utilize the court, particularly on this question, as Mo and Dorian were talking about, of electoral and social justice and, and movement politics is part of how we have President Trump. Obama's going to hold that for a minute. Let's talk about why that was a failure, though. And I think this lets, let, lets me get back into to, to Mo's point. Um, one, and, and look, I, Obama, did, Ob this is not Obama's uh, uh, shining uh, accomplishment, um, his, his appointment of judges, um, his willingness to allow McConnell to stall him um, on so many appointments. But like, look at why that happened. 
And from where I sit, the reason why that happened is because for too long, Democrats have wanted to play nice with Republicans. Democrats have believed that Republicans would be acting in good faith as partners in government, as opposed to de trying to defeat Republicans from the ground up. And that's where we get into Mo's point about the importance of activism um, around not just your presidential election, but all of the races up and down the ballot in order to get structural change. So like when I get, you know, Jamal Bowman's my district, so yay. You know, but when I get involved in local politics, I'm involved um, not just on my congressional politics, but on those DA races. If you want to stop police brutality, your very first opportunity to vote on that is your local district attorney, right? Um, I think Larry Krasner should be on the Supreme Court. I think Wesley Bell should be on the Supreme Court. Like these are, but like that's never going to happen if we don't uh, focus on uh, uh, getting those people into power at the ground level. And that can only be started, that can only happen with movement politics and with getting people to understand that their local races are every bit as important as their presidential elections, right? So that, that, that's the kind of the overview. And then just to pick up some other things. Um, that I've said and like wait for uh, uh, Professor uh, Harris Perry to, to chat at me again. Uh, the, the <laughs> it was a loving, it was a loving <laughs> agitation. <laughs> the, 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 with all of that said, we still have to stop the assholes, right? Like, like we can talk about, I am all for structural change and I'm all for uh, of a reform and I'm all for kind of all of these good things. But we can't forget that there are uniquely bad people in power who need to be brought to justice. So to go back to my ICC point, when the International Criminal Court, when they go and, and, and charge somebody who gasses their own people, which, by the way, it's almost always they'll charge a person of color who gasses their own people as opposed to uh, bring criminal charges against white leaders. But when they charge somebody who gasses their own people, they don't go back and charge the gas manufacturer. They don't go back and charge the oligarchs who set up the system. Like, they don't, they don't charge the structural problems. They charge the person who committed a bad act. And while I agree that all of these reforms need to be happen, we also have to have accountability for the uniquely bad people committing bad acts in our politics, right? So you have to do something, you know, once Trump is gone, however that happens, you have to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You have to go back and hold Trump accountable, hold Barr accountable, hold these bad actors accountable, because if you don't, then when, Tom Cotton is president in 2028, when Nikki Haley is president in 2032, which will happen because Americans are stupid and they will always, you know, whatever, um, they'll just do the same things. All right, so look, the number of things here. So first of all, yes, there are going to be Republican presidents and there are going to be Democratic presidents in the future. Not because Americans are stupid, but because Americans do not all agree with one another. And so this is part of why I always cringe a little bit at the, oh, the problem is that Democrats just aren't willing to blow the whole thing up. Because actually, I, I am a, I'm kind of interested in what this experiment in self-governance looks like if we do imagine that we could live together in a country where we consent to be governed and where losing an election does not mean losing all of one's rights. So I just wanna, I wanna lay that out there for a second. And then the next thing I wanna do is I wanna back up a little bit on the Supreme Court conversation around the Obama administration. I just wanna say, I'm actually thinking of it slightly differently. So yes, there's a kind of stand in the schoolhouse door, massive resistance that occurs from the Republicans towards the Obama administration appointments of judges at all levels. But then of course there's the Merrick Garland moment. And so the Merrick Garland moment, I just want to be clear, I, or Girl in America, or Joe Bill, but you know what? You know why I can't quite remember? Because I don't really give a shit. And that's part of the problem. In their last moment, knowing, I'm saying this again, knowing he would not get a vote, they put up, you know, the equivalent to Hillary Clinton's vice presidential nominee, right? They put up someone who is a warm body, Democratish, liberalish kind of person. When, if you understood the movement, for example, you would say, wait a minute, now the only reason President Obama was elected or elected again, and the folks who were driving this movement are black women. 
What if, given that we know we're not going to get a vote, we need to not say, think about the court. Nobody thinks about the court. No one cares about the court. People care about particular individuals. They can, they care, they can, they can, people got stuff to do. We gotta figure out how I'm gonna educate my kids and work simultaneously on the Zoom. So I'm gonna need a high information system. So what you need to do is to nominate Anita Hill. You nominate Anita Hill, which first of all allows Joe Biden to make the apology he needed to make decades ago. You nominate Anita Hill, and the option here is that if y'all go ahead and turn out and vote, Anita Hill can sit next to Clarence Thomas for the rest of their natural lives. Now, I don't know if you remembered how Black women showed out when there was no vote for Loretta Lynch, day one, day two, day 30, day 60, sorors all just dressed in red and white, marching around the Capitol, losing our minds over the Attorney General not getting a vote. Imagine that we had an actual Black woman not garlic mayor, Merrick garlic, whoever that is, sitting there. So to understand the movement, I think you can't think of the people as dumb or, look, if Nikki Haley wins the American presidency, then that will be because the Republicans have a woman of color in the South as the governor. I want to say that again. The Republicans had a Southern woman of color as the governor in South Carolina who brought down the Confederate flag. So if she wins, it will be because somebody at the GOP knew to write a damn check to Nikki Haley when she was running. But notice how the state of Georgia could have had a black woman who's a, so, all right. So I'm gonna back up for a minute. Right. I'm so, just gonna say, I am never gonna buy the story that any warm body Democrat might be better because I lived Reagan and then I lived Clinton. And, and I just think that's the most dangerous argument we can make. I think it is fine to say, throw this sucker Trump out. But I think it is so crucial that we not say that, you know, as long as Joe Biden sort of wakes up on the leftish side of the bed, that it's going to be better. And the last thing I'll say on this is in part because for all the evil that this administration is substantively, how many Confederate statues came down during the Obama administration? How many people could name the Secretary of Education during the Obama administration? How part of what happened to the good enemy? Right, of course you could. Uh, uh, all right, Bernie Duncan was a good guy. But look, right. I, but I, I, the good enemy focuses attention, right? You had the number of white people running around talking about white supremacy is wrong. What white? White people didn't even say white supremacy existed during Obama. Now it's not Obama's fault, but I'm saying Trump has inspired a level of like internal acknowledgement of some bullshit that white folks have maybe been needing to deal with for a moment. So that doesn't make it okay. It doesn't mean we don't throw them out, but it does mean remember, right? We're always gonna have some. And then the very last thing I'm gonna say is, I think that you made the argument for why law sucks. And so as an abolitionist feminist, when you say, oh, we need to go take these uniquely bad actors and take them to the justice system, which is gonna make one-off decisions and not look at structures, I'm like, yep, and this is reason number 499 why I did not go to law school. The first 498 are really good too, and one of them has to do with loans. <laughs> but the idea that the way law manages things is on a case-by-case -case individual bad actors decision is part of why we're abolitionists. It's part of why we say, actually, you don't get it. It's not the one bad actor, but it's that the one bad, bad actor is empowered by a system of badness. And so what we have to do is change that system. Also, there's some really good questions to hear about going back to school yeah. that I think we should answer. We're going to come, we're going to come back to Ellie. Can you do a minute response to Melissa? And then Maurice, I want to do one more question to you and to the group um, that's, that's a bit different, and then we're going to open it up. So Ellie, you want to do one quick response here? Democrats lose the courts not because individual Democratic actors are bad at it, but it's because the whole Democratic Party establishment has failed to make the one-to-one -one connection to Democratic voters about how important the courts are versus how important everything else that they want is. The Republicans, who I will maintain, are dumb. Um, the Republicans have, have, have done a great job of telling their voters that anything they want has to happen through the courts. They don't like gay people, you have to go to the courts. They don't like abortion, you have to go to the courts. You want religious liberty, you have to go to the courts. The Republicans make that one-to-one -one connection to their voters who are not smarter than Democratic voters all the time. The Democrats fail to make that connection and that's why we lose. It's not just because Obama was bad at this part of the game, although I agree he was bad at this part of the game, is because structurally our party has not made the case to our base of just how critical the court is for us to succeed. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move um, I'm gonna move from the courts to a different court.
and I want to talk about basketball and sports for a second. So the WNBA dream, the Mercury players, they wore Vote Warnock shirts to their game the other day. The Reverend Raphael Warnock, the, the minister of Ebenezer Baptist Church, is running for Senate in Georgia against Kelly Loeffler. Uh, she is a very vocal opponent to the movement for Black Lives. She's also the co-owner of the dream. And she put out a statement saying that her players supporting her opponent is an example of out of control cancel culture. So we have that happening. And then we also have corporations who have been very quick to issue statements of support around Black Lives Matter. So Maurice, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, by the way, we have Michael Jordan, remember him? $100 million commitment to the movement for racial justice, even though back in the day he said Republicans buy sneakers too. So something has happened. More I take that personally, Dorian. And, and my, Listen, this is why President Trump is great. He done I'm made Michael Jordan a whole activist. Look, something's happened. So Maurice, talk to, talk to us about um, corporate strategy here, because my worry is that we might end up with a rainbow oligarchy, right? That we're just going to put some black faces in corporations, which we already have, and then we're going to all get co-opted by corporate power. How do we, what's the strategy around corporate power and culture in this moment in terms of the movement for black lives? How should we think about it? Sure, that's a great question. And I don't think it's a might, I think it's a, it's a will. That, that will happen if we don't intervene and organize, right? And, you know, I think we have to just like be super like sharp with our analysis here, right? There's a significant difference between challenging white supremacy as a structure and sort of like liberal diversity, right? Which is obsessed with representation, right? And we have to have a, just have a, have a more nuanced conversation. Even in the conversation now that we're talking about the, the VP pick, Biden's VP pick, and we're talking necessarily about representation. We should be talking about represent, rep, representation. Representation is important, but representation alone is insu insufficient. And, um, you know, I, I got like, I, somebody forwarded me a Black Lives Matter email from SoulCycle, right? Um, <laughs> and, and to me, there's two things that I think that that represents. Number one, I look at those things, those performative actions, the yellow um, sort of street art that's emerged in certain cities, all those things. Um, you know, I guarantee you that zero Black people asked for Lift Every Voice and Sing to be sung <laughs> in the beginning of an event, like zero black people asked for them, right? And so I think that that's an indicator um, that our movement is winning. Whenever our opponents, whenever folks in power are, are offering concessions, even concessions we don't ask for, they're trying to offload the concessions that put them at, at the least risk in order to, to somehow abate our concerns and to, to sort of you know, allow the movement to feel like we've had a win and to pacify the movement, right? But to me, that means it's, it's sort of like when a bully says, ouch, then you got to squeeze even harder in that, in that exact right place. And, and to me, that's a bully saying, ouch, and offering up all types of random non-structural concessions. The game, the, the name of the game needs to be structural power. And, you know, there's a, there's a significant difference between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms, right? So what I love about the Breathe Act, what I love about the, the movement to divest and invest from policing, what they seek to do, all of these reforms seek to essentially constrain the power of organized capital, constrain and limit the power of white suprem supremacy structurally, and at the same time, deepen democratic power and the, the, the power for black people to organize. And if we use that as a prism to think about these corporate concessions, these, these um, political concessions, then that's one of the ways that we could uh, judge whether or not these are meaningful or merely, merely performative. And, I, and we have to be really sharp about that. And n nine times out of 10, the first salvo will not be meaningful, right? The first salvo is what could we give these folks so that they'll leave us alone? Right. I mean, any Democratic mayor could put some yellow paint on a street anywhere. Right. And they'll be given props to do that. That is insufficient. We, want, we need to look at budgets. We need to look at at structures. We need to look at dramatically changing the ability for us to be able to organize in general, which is why I think it's super important for us to focus like a laser on power. One of the to me, we have this conversation to me about sort of the Democratic Party and the Republican. One of the reasons why I'm building the Working Families Party is that the, the far right and corporations have a party. They've captured a party. 
um, the left doesn't have a party, right? Within the Democratic Party um, umbrella, you have people who represent the interest of, of organized capital and represent the interests of Wall Street and people who identify as democratic social, socialists. That umbrella <laughs> is ripe with contradictions. And as long as, as we have a, a, a country that doesn't have a proper left that could govern and has its own party structures, like any, you know, like uh, Professor Harris Perry talked about this idea of us conceding to being governed. I think part of it is having a proper left that represents working people. If working people had proper party structures and, pop, um, and proper internally democratic institutions like labor unions, but, which have been attacked for decades, that we called our own, then we could consent. If the rules like actually operated in a way, then we could consent as long as those structures don't exist. Um, then, and, and as more as our entire um, political structure is corporately captured, you're gonna have you know, I, this whole American project, I think, is, should be called into question. And so, you know, to answer your question in a very long way, <laughs> um, you know, I, fundamentally, we need to scrutinize all of these concessions and focus on power and structures. So, um, Ellie and Melissa, I want to get you in here. Uh, this is the speed round time. <laughs> so, short and crisp, because I have a whole bunch of questions from the chat that I'm going to just put on the table as soon as I get you both in this. So, uh, Ellie, and then Melissa. Uh, <laughs> you know what? Uh, 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 welcome to the party. You know, uh, you know I, I, I am in the Sam Seaborn. Um, let's ignore the fact that you relate to the party and embrace the fact that you showed up at all. Um, and, I do, and I do think that the fact that this movement right now is being a little bit more, uh, is multi-ethnic and multi-cultural and multi-gendered um, is a good sign. Um, I, gives a, I gives two flying wheels about SoCycle suddenly uh, 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 joining the movement. There, there's, more, there's just more serious work to, be do, to do that I'm not sure those corporations are willing to do, but I never expect them to be willing to do, so I don't really care. Speed. Yeah, so, uh, so I, I would agree that um, this kind of corporate engagement is insufficient, um, but it's not completely inconsequential. So again, I'm a North Carolinian, and what I watched happen in my own state around HB2 was, um, you know, if, if you look at the election where Governor Cooper was elected, basically Republicans went in and they voted the whole ballot straight down, Trump to the, to the school board Republican, but for the governor, they chose Cooper, they chose the Democrat. And so that wasn't because like they were suddenly progressive or something. That was just because North Carolina lost so much money on sports, right? So when the sports teams um, pulled out and said they wouldn't play here, um, then the next thing you know, we have a Democratic governor. And why did that matter more than for any other single reason? Because Cooper ain't no big progressive is because he expanded Medicaid, right? And so that again, if we're talking about the structures, so now come COVID times, it matters to live in a Southern state with an expanded Medicaid. So I just wanna say, it is, of course it's insufficient. And this is part of why I, I continue to grieve, like literally wake up grieving about the loss of Congressman Lewis. There are very few individuals in the movement or in any movement and very, very few institutions and movements that don't end up captured in some way. He was one of the few who, despite going inside, never was captured. But I mean, he's just better than the rest of us. So I just, you know, again, I just want to say, as long as we are existing in capitalism, that the, the realities of how big capital and corporations will begin to engage, I just think it's just important for us to, to have a little bit of like, you know, I think maybe, it's, you know, not that we don't care, but that we kind of look at it side eye. Last thing I'll say is I didn't say conceding to being governed, I said consenting. And, and I do think that that really matters, not only because consent is sexy, um, but also because consent is, you know, the, the constitution kind of sucks, but the Declaration of Independence is basically perfect in that it is so fundamentally aspirational. And this notion that in 1776, a enslaver would write not enslaver words, right, but words that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then this is the really key part that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among persons deriving their just powers from consent of the governed. There is no place on the planet 
1776 where that is self-evident. And yet to simply assert that it is not a just government unless we are consenting to being governed, I think is quite an extraordinary experiment and I'm down for it. And by the way, nobody's got a working left right now. I mean, really, nobody. No one has a working left. So we're really just sort of not American exceptional. Professor, it sounded like you kind of made an argument that the warm body Democratic governor of North Carolina could still do some good. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, oh. yeah, absolutely. Oh. I would oh. much rather have Cooper, but I would also much rather have Stacey Abrams, North Carolina style, than yes. Cooper. And so I'm just saying, notice that the DNC noticed it was important to give money to Cooper. Um, speed, speed, speed round. So okay. I'm about to throw. Speed four. round, DCCC sucks. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so here, here's four categories of questions from, from our, our viewers and listeners. One is around, um, have we been in a nonviolent civil war for a couple decades? And if so, how does it end? Second, uh, nonviolent civil war. So the, the right has been much clearer about uh, stoking division on purpose. Uh, yep. And that you might imagine what we've been living through these last several decades has been um, sort of a, a, a neo-Confederate politics. Let me frame it that way. Yep, yep, uh, yep. That we have to be clear about. Okay, that's one. Then there's a whole bunch of questions under electoral. Um, how do we how do we influence the Democratic Party platform? What's what's to do with the Breathe Act? Uh, as 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 a, as a model, as a marker, piece of legislation that's visionary. Mm -hmm. How do we um, deal with keeping young people engaged beyond the election? What are the deep Democratic structural reforms? Um, yep. Is it multi-member districts? Is it proportional representation? Is it mandatory voting, universal voting? So. That's all underneath the question of electoral or electoral system. Third right. category, a whole bunch of questions about teachers and school openings. If you have thought about that, jump in. What should we do? Uh, my, my favorite teachers union, because I'm from Chicago, Chicago Teachers Union, just a shout out. They're about to go on strike against the black gay mayor of Chicago. So just to say, um, there's a lot going on with teachers. Last but not least, mainstream media, what do we do about it? Okay, go. Okay. Sounds like the, feels like the right's been pretty violent with their civil war. I don't know. But, all right. <laughs> I, I think I could I could try to do this quickly. So I I would just challenge the idea that it's been nonviolent. I think if you're somebody in the mark, like real violence, not just like theoretical violence, actual dead people, right? I would say perhaps low intensity. I would say perhaps um, not simply using the traditional military tactics, but but actually like it, counterinsurgency, everything, squat teams, violence. Okay, so, um, and yes, um, it's very racialized. So yes, I think all of those analogies uh, actually play. Breathe Act, um, I think, um, again, I think the Breathe Act is revolutionary because it's a, it's a social movement that, is, uh, that has developed a, a framework that seeks to disinvest from, from, from capital and to reinvest in our communities. And, and, and like, I, I, don't, I don't know where you have a, a moment in time where we actually have sitting Congress people, um, you know, uh, co-sponsor legislation that does that on that level. And the way we do it, I think, is by energizing social movement energy. And the may, if, if we are to succeed and have the Breathe Act become law, it, w it will be because not Joe Biden, not any politician, but our movements are the main protagonists of this moment. And so I think that that I'm focused on how do we ferment social movement energy in this moment. And when that happens, all types of things we never thought were possible can happen. And then, yes, multi-member districts, I, I, I believe very strongly in them. Um, statehood for DC, I think that's a huge structural change that needs to happen like yesterday. Um, and all the reforms in HR1 should have happened if we, if we believe like we live in a democracy. So that should get one day, that should, get, that should be past day one if uh, we defeat the forces of evil. Um, you know, the teacher's question, really complicated, but essentially, um, you know, uh, again, it's, if we can't invest in the structures needed to ensure that working people, all of the working people involved in educating our, our children could work in safe environments and they're, they're able to utilize their, their unions in order to advocate for themselves and that our, our children are safe, then we can't, we can't have in-person school. And so our, our, our country needs to invest in every, all the structures necessary to make that happen. And I think this is political. I think one of the strategies here is by starving the commons and, and creating this unnecessary conflict between teachers and parents. This is a political ploy during an election where they want to cleave off some percentage of parents to align with them around this false 
sort of um, unnecessary conflict around opening schools. Invest in opening schools so that we could open schools and then actually invest in a proper uh, public health system so that, you know, we're, deal we're dealing properly like many other countries with the pandemic in general. Okay. Ellie, then Melissa, and then hopefully we can go five minutes over um, just because I want to get the three of you after this round into like a 30 second closing thing. So Ellie and then Melissa, and then we'll do one more really, 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 really fast round. The most important electoral issue to me um, is voting rights. And the only way that we do anything about voting rights is by having Democrat judges, having the Republican justice, the thing that binds Republican judges, whether they were appointed by Trump or Bush or the other Bush or Reagan, the thing that binds them all is not abortion. It's not antipathy to gay rights. It is their antipathy to voting rights. It is John Roberts, a Bush appointee who gutted the Voting Rights Act. It is Anthony Kennedy, a Reagan appointee who helped him. Like the, the you, you have to under, people have to understand that when you elect, when you allow Republicans to pick federal judges, what you are picking is voter suppression through direct suppression that we're seeing now by refusing to extend deadlines through subtle suppression um, that we see through gerrymandering and everything in between. That is the one thing that binds the Republican judicial philosophy, not letting people vote. So if we defeat evil, the first thing that has to happen is that we put judges on all of our courts who respect and will defend voting rights. That's the electoral question. I'll just very quickly say on the school thing, because it's really important to me, I've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. Those People need to get the hell out of my house. I get it. Like it is, uh, it is a lot. My, you know, uh, I, I am less, I am less productive at work because I'm trying to homeschool them. My wife is less productive at her job because she's trying to homeschool them. Like it is a problem. And yet, there is no way that I feel like it's okay for me to ask my kids' teachers to risk their lives so that I can have, you know, an hour and a half of peace of quiet. And that, that, is the, that is a push-pull here. We are in the situation because of our incompetent pandemic response. Other countries are in the position to open their schools because they have done the right things with the virus. Our country has not. Our country is, has, that, that is why we are in um, this terrible position. And the, the, the last thing I'll say about that is that my kids happen to go to private school. Um, thank you, nation. Um, <laughs> the amount of resources that rich school districts are able to put in place to both protect the kids and the teachers are completely different than the amount of resources public schools, especially public schools and poor areas are being able to put in place. What that should show everybody is that the, the inequality, the differences that we've been talking about through this whole hour, when the, the pandemic is putting the rubber to the road on all of these inequalities and all of it, will disproportionately affect students of color, poor students, and teachers who serve those students of colors and, 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 and economically disadvantaged areas. Everything that we've, we've said for a long time about inequalities in school is happening now and it's going to get people killed. Melissa. So I just wanna echo that, of course, there's been a civil war. Um, it's probably not partisan, but it is certainly not nonviolent. It's really important to always remember, for example, that even the so-called nonviolent um, movement of the 1960s was never nonviolent. In fact, it was provocative of violence. It was sort of the whole point. It was nonviolent direct action. And then the goal of that nonviolent direct action was to lay bare the level of violence that was occurring against old people, young people, all of that. So I just want to say there's never been any moment in the American project that has been non Violent, but especially for brown people, black people, um, and especially for women of color who experience violence not only in the public sphere, not only relative to the state, but often, right, and maybe most egregiously um, within community itself, so that there is simply no safe place uh, for queer folk, for femme folk, uh, and for, um, for women, uh, trans, and cis folk. So, so yes to that. On the question of how you get the Democratic Party to do better, I just want to point out there are parts of the Democratic Party that are doing better, right? So even in, for example, bringing out the Breathe Act, right? Um, you know, that that is putting onto the table the folks who are doing better. I've already talked about Stacey Abrams multiple times, Ayanna Presley, AOC. There are folks who are doing better. And so this is, um, this is one of those responses that definitely has its good and bad. But let me just say, I am actually supportive of long, but firm term limits in the US Congress. 
Um, and one of the reasons that I'm strongly for this has to do with the weirdnesses of the Democratic Party, which is full of um, the boomer pluses, um, white guys who are who have to be defeat like so a Cory Bush, right, um, or even an Ayanna Presley has to spend inordinate right effort to um, get past their own party. Um, but if you had strong, long, right? So I don't mean four years, I don't mean, you know, even eight years, but you know, a, a 10 to 16 year limit, but then go find something else to do. Work on K Street, get the hell out, right? So some notion that the, that the party has to bring in fresh people for Democrats would mean, right, some massive changes demographically in who we are. And some of that would also lead to some progressive changes. So that's part Part of where I stand on that. I think no one needs to be worried about how to keep young people involved. I'm going to say that again. No one needs to be worried about how to keep young people involved. Be much more worried about how to keep old people involved. Young people got this. They're real good. They may burn the whole shit down. You might want to make them less involved. But right now, young people who were already as millennials, right, facing um, a a future that was not as bright as that of their parents and grandparents. Now you have a Z generation. Um, and, and then I want to talk in this question also about uh, teachers and students, right? But you have Zs and then whoever it is that's coming after the Zs facing levels of inequality that I assure you, right, the only thing that the left needs to do relative to young people is to fund and resource them in the ways that the right does. So I'm a college professor, I've been on college campuses for 20 years, and for all the discourse about these lefty campuses, the truth is that the best resourced student organizations over the past 20 years on college campuses are things like Turning Point, conservative student newspapers, and I, I got no beef with it. They invested in their young people. And that soccer in law school. It'll have meaningful um, effects. Um, the next thing I'll just say is how do we fix the US media in many of the same ways. You just got to know that there are lots of smart people and good people in US broadcast media. US print media is actually pretty good. Radio is pretty good. Podcast is pretty good, like all of those. But the the great icon of, of US media that people tend to mean when they say that is televised and particularly televised cable news. And that is a cesspool of evil. And I want to be clear, it's not a cesspool of evil because the individual, because there's a bunch of individual bad actors who need to be dragged off to the hay. Actually, most people are pretty great. But all of the systems there benefit and move towards a particular set of practices. So I'm very, very clear that President Trump is president largely because a television camera is very much like love and water and sunlight. Anything you put a television camera on will grow. I'm gonna say it one more time. Anything that you put a television camera on will grow. Notice that we have a reality TV president because the reality TV president fundamentally understands this. If you point a television camera at it, the overwhelming power of television means that that thing will grow. How many Real Housewives do we have? Count the city. That's how many, because if you point a camera at it, it will grow. So all of the networks, and especially MSNBC in 2016, made clear directives to put the camera on candidate Trump. They sent directives that said, even if there is an empty podium, take the empty podium with a breaking news banner rather than any of the other substantive GOP candidates. And this goes to my point about it can't be just let's beat the Republicans. I want a healthy, robust, sane Republican Party. I would much rather that we have put the camera on Jeb or Lou Marco or any of those people I don't want to be president, but you don't choose the president with the television camera, which is precisely what happened in 2016. And I will tell you that the Trump presidency has made MSNBC rich and relevant, and it is very much in their interest to see a Trump second term. I'm not saying they can make it happen. I'm saying it is within their interests. So if you want a different media, turn that shit off because they will absolutely respond to that. Watch Joy and nothing else. One more time. Watch Joy and nothing else. Okay, great. Last thing on teachers and students. I have students and, I, I'm, and I'm a teacher. Here in North Carolina, 20% of the students in my county in Foresight have never been heard from again since March. We literally don't know what happened to them. I don't want teachers, custodians, cafeteria workers. I don't want the people cleaning up after my college kids to get sick. I don't want them to die. I don't, but 
if my, if my college doesn't open, I also don't know what happens because we're the largest employer in the city and there's no safety net. So people will guaranteed starve. They're only 10% likely to die. And that is obscene. That is obscene, but that is literally the nature of what we are now looking at. If the babies don't go back to school, the ones that are lost are our babies. <laughs> They're the little black children without Wi-Fi, who 20% of them we already haven't heard from, and they've been in school until March. So I don't know what the answer to this is, but I know it is not simple. And I know that it's not just like, well, we gotta protect everybody's lives, because I know these babies are, they're gonna learn third grade, they're gonna lose fourth grade. You can't go to fifth grade math without it. You can't hold everybody back because there's too many. Like this is a real like, oh shit, our hair is on fire situation that is not easily solved with cute online classes. So yes, this is a real crisis. Keep asking about it. Um, only here on The Nation will you get this kind of analysis. Yeah, because I don't talk to free for, to nobody, so, you know. So I want to do 30 seconds, last words. What do you want to leave people with? Where do we go from here? What do people do? So Ellie, Maurice, Melissa, and then we'll say thank you to all of you for joining us. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 87 years old. Stephen Breyer is 81 years old. There is no issue that you care about that survives a Supreme Court that is seven to two Republican. There's just, you care about climate change, they will deregulate the crap out of that. You care about gun violence, ha 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 is There is simply nothing that you care about that can survive Trump getting two or three more Supreme Court picks or any more federal judicial, uh, federal judiciary picks. So just please, please vote. And I guess the very last thing I'll say is, um, so, like a lot of, of, of African-American people who grew up in a privileged environment, blah, 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 there's a bit of imposter syndrome that I have, that I have, right? Like, I don't know if I could have fought in the civil rights era. I don't know if I could have gotten my head smashed in the lunch counter. I don't know what I could have done. I hope that I would have done well. But this election, Republican judges are asking us to risk our lives to vote. And damn it, I'm going to vote. And so I just want to leave people with that. Thanks, Sally. Maurice. Sure. Um, the, the one note that I'll just re reiterate is, and it, it points to something that uh, Professor Harris Perry said, right? Which is, sure, Trump is horrible. However, it's wholly insufficient to simply think that defeating Donald Trump electorally is like a slam dunk win for democracy, right? And it's essential, it's, it's essential that we do that, that we defeat Trump, we defeat Trumpism, all of the folks who have enabled, a Trump, enabled Trump on the federal government, federal government all the way down, down ballot. Um, but that simply creates the terrain of struggle for our movements to be the protagonists that we need them to be in order to usher in potentially a, a different era of, of American politics at a time when, you know, we have really complicated, very large scale existential questions to answer. And so naturally we need very, very big, very bold structural change sort of strategies to answer them. And our movements, the ideas that emerge from our movements, the urgency of our movements are where those solutions and where the intensity of, the, of, of and the need for those solutions are emerging. So if I think if anybody could do anything the one thing that I think would be the most effective and your highest purpose is to support the movement for Black Lives in this moment. With your money, with your time, with your efforts, even if you don't understand, even if you're asking questions, your role in this moment in order to save our democracy is to support uh, the movement of the day, the movement for Black Lives, which is both asking and answering these questions and creating a multiracial alignment of people, drawing people, tens of millions of people into action right now. Thanks, Mo. Melissa. Yeah, um, I, I think I'd go, I'd go with both of those answers. Vote, um, ensure that you are registered to vote, vote, support any organization that is ensuring that we can vote by mail. Um, and um, potentially, if, you, if it's possible, work to um, support voter registration efforts locally. But voting is like the brushing your teeth of democracy. Glad you did it, but I'm not giving you an award for it. So also think very hard about the possibility of either running for office yourself or recruiting the best and brightest brown woman that you know to run for some office, whether it is dog catcher, whether it is city council, 
what we know is that, that boys and men are often told as young people, man, you ought to run for office. And girls and women almost always never are. So if you see a brilliant young brown woman, um, tell her she ought to think about running for office. Second, support the movement for black lives and do so through existing organizations. I'm a big fan of Color for Change. Give, give Color of Change a little change. And of course, I'm a big fan of Duran Warren's organization. And so uh, Duran, I think you should put in the chat um, uh, uh, community changes um, uh, thing. I'm, yeah, I'm Melissa running for office. Third, read, 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 read. And read things about people who are not like you, both on a left side and on a right side. And read things written by black and brown women. One more time, read things that have been written by black and brown women. I have some syllabi that I can share with you. And the very last thing is drink much more water than you think you need. I know that seems silly, but if we don't survive this, and Zoom is very dehydrating and all of the efforts and work that we do, so drink more water than you ever thought you needed because it matters to keep yourself in some kind of healthy condition because the struggle is gonna continue. So I wanna thank our esteemed guests, Ellie Mistal, Maurice Mo Mitchell, Melissa Harris Perry. I don't have imposter syndrome about this webinar. This is the most fire, brilliant, exciting conversation that I think a lot of us have been in in a long time. And I hope you have enjoyed those of you watching. Um, support the Nation Magazine, of course, founded by abolitionists in 1865. They've been in this game for a long time, y'all. Um, and they've been running in the red since 1867. <laughs> so support the Nation.